Right, I see we have a, a few stragglers still arriving, but uh, I think we will kick into it. Let's see if this works. Wow, technology, it's marvelous. Um, so first of all, thank you for, uh, thank you for coming in. It was uh, it's a, a tough slot, this one. There's some other really good talks, so I, I really appreciate you guys uh, coming along here. Uh, just very quickly, little introduction. Uh, who am I? Uh, my name is Dave Russell, um, Principal Solution Engineer at Hortonworks. Um, I spend my time in sort of one of three different locations, uh, mostly on customer sites with organizations looking to uh, adopt or already adopting the Apache Metron cybersecurity platform, whiteboarding, going through interesting presentations, deep dives, all that sort of good stuff. Uh, I spend a lot of my time at airports. I cover um, EMEA and, uh, and APAC, so that's uh, a lot of air miles. And very occasionally, you will find me at home in the UK where I live in the middle of nowhere. Uh, my dream is eventually to live completely separated from the entire world, but for now, um, I'm very much a part of it. Uh, I also, uh, and if you recognize my voice from uh, the Roaring Elephant podcast, Thank you. Um, I am a co-founder of the Roaring Elephant podcast. My co-host, Jon, is uh, there at the back in the yellow jacket. Um, he continues to wear his. I don't because it's really, really hot. So say hi to Jon after this session as well. All right. So this is the, uh, the last slot pretty much before lunch. So I'm sure you're all really hungry. Um, but let's see how active you are. So we're going to do a little bit. Everybody raise your hands. All right, so now I know that you can all raise your hands, so there's no excuses. All right, so who here is from a cybersecurity team? Nice, you are my people. Um, who here is from a BI or analytics team? Nice, good, good. Um, who here is from like a, a big data sort of platform team? A lot of you guys as well, excellent. Anyone here from a data science team? Oh, yeah, come on, don't be shy. There's a, there's a few of you guys. Nice, nice, all right. Anyone else from like some other team? Oh, right, I'll have to talk to you later because I'm really curious. All right, so who here is hands on keyboard? Yeah, a good chunk, a good chunk of you, good. Um, who here is more of the architect kind of designer yeah, some of you guys as well, good. Managers? Yeah, yeah. And uh, other people? Yeah, okay. Uh, all right. So not too many more of these, I promise. But where are you guys in your big data journey? Like, who here has Hadoop in production? Excellent, excellent. It's interesting kind of doing this every year you see the, the evolution of the audience. That's really nice. So who here is still kind of evaluating Hadoop-based solutions? Yeah, it's a couple of you guys. Who here is still just investigating big data? Oh, nice. OK, and anyone not started yet? Brilliant. Does anybody not know where their organization is in big data, by the way, just in case? Good. I'm really glad to hear that. OK, and finally, who here, well, what do people here know about Apache Metron? So who, anybody here committing code, docs, patches? Oops. Ah, excellent. I like that. Um, who's running in production? Or near production? Yeah, 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 there's, there's, there's a few of you. Who's, la who's still in the lab? Yeah, yeah, a few more of you. Um, Who's just reading, researching? Nice. Many of you are yet to embrace the, uh, the full power of the journey. Anyone here that's just Apache who? I think I'm in the wrong place. I've just come here for the stickers. <laughs> All right. So let's, let's, many of you, it seems, um, are reasonably, or have some idea about what Apache Metron's all about. Um, but there are still some people in the audience that uh, it's still something quite new. So what I'll do is run through just very quickly 
quick intro to Apache Metron. So one of the first questions, why? Why would you even, why would you even do this? Well, there are many reasons. Um, the one that I find is easiest to explain is really around just simple retention. So if you look at um, the average sort of cybersecurity silo, like, there's no shortage of data in cybersecurity. You've all got IDS, IPS, firewalls, routers, antivirus, host-based entity protection, all this kind of magical stuff. And it's all churning out data 24-7. And you've got Seam platforms, and you've got new UABA platforms, and all this kind of stuff. So there's no shortage of data in cybersecurity. But what we're lacking is that consistent vision across all of that data. Then if you factor all of that data that's been generated over periods of time, most organizations I talk to that haven't embraced the big data journey for cybersecurity yet, their average retention period is somewhere between three and six months. I've been optimistic here, and I've said six months. The average breach, according to um, last year's um, Verizon cybersecurity report, the average breach um, or duration before a breach is detected is eight months. That means in the majority of cases, by the time you find out that you've been breached, the core or the raw data is already expired. It's already rolled off your systems. Now, some people say, well, we can keep six months active, um, and we archive off up to 12 months somewhere else. How do you get that archived data back? Well, it's, it's quite a painful exercise, actually. Um, how long does it take? Um, days, weeks. We, we sometimes never bother, because it's just too painful. Those are the kind of conversations that organizations have. And it sounds like I can see a lot of nodding in the audience as people are very familiar with this story. Um, let's put that into perspective. Um, so these are the average silo retentions. That's the average duration that breaches go unnoticed. Um, this is Police One. It was a breach of a system that contained law enforcement details, FBI agent details, um, locations. This is Yahoo in the US. And very recently, of course, we've had fabulous Facebook and Cambridge Analytica, which you know, the, the, the fact around this data leakage was really not publicized um, until pretty much four years. So when you're in this position, this is very clearly a big data, a big data question. Um, also, I have a, a quote I like here from a guy called Ian Levy. Um, he is the uh, technical director of the National Cybersecurity Center in the UK, which is uh, a subdivision, if you like, from GCHQ. And um, his quote that uh, you can see here is around um, category one cyber incidents. Now, this, was, this quote came out um, around about Q3 last year. And up until that time, they'd been running for about a year, they'd seen 500 what they call or what they categorize level three incidents. That's a single company involved. They'd also categorized 30 events at a category two um, where many organizations are involved. Um, if you look at uh, the most famous of those, um, WannaCry, this is a, uh, a list of the organizations that have, uh, or a snapshot of the list of organizations that uh, have already put their hands up to say that they were affected. Um, there are many more, I'm sure. This was just a, a snapshot of the, the list off of Wikipedia at a point in time. So a category one is where we're really going to need a, a national response to this. So WannaCry doesn't even categorize as that bad. So what does Apache Metron look like? Um, first of all, Let's, let's take a look at some data. So this is uh, a data set that came from Los Alamos National Labs. They had a red team exercise. Um, some of you, if you were in uh, Simon's session earlier, you'll have hear, heard him talking about this data set and some of the interesting things we can do with profiling around that. Um, what that looks once it's gone through Metron and once we've run, done some profiling on it is you get uh, all the events in the alerts UI here. And you can see that right at the top, we've got a bunch of events with a score of 100. And at that point, the event has already gone through streaming in real time. It's been scored. It's been enriched. And we even have 
a relatively human readable and human understandable description of why the event is, uh, is scored that way. So in this particular case, the distinct number of machines that user 22 attempted to log in to is more than five standard deviations from the median. So all of these statistics are being crunched live on the fly. So what is Apache Metron? So this is it at a very high level. Um, I'm not going to talk really about too much into this because I'd rather get into who's doing what with it. But safe to say, it's a streaming analytics platform specifically for cybersecurity. Um, it uses things like Storm and Kafka and many of the other animals in the zoo underneath the hood. One of the key components of it, though, is the profiler. Now, the profiler is, for me, one of the pieces that, that makes Metron magic. Um, there are a number of interesting things you can do with the profiler, but think about it as generating in real time user and entity-based analytical information across every single user, every single server, every single device, every single application log within your infrastructure, and being able to combine and profile that across all of those different things. Now, many tools have some sort of ability to do this, um, but what they don't have is the ability to really store that for any duration of time. Because of the way the profiler works, each individual time window slot for each individual data source is only about a couple of kilobytes. Now, that means that over a two-year period for, say, 50 average profiles, so say you're profiling you know, number of login attempts or something like that, that would be one profile. So say 50 profiles, profiling every five minutes across 10,000 users for a medium-sized company infrastructure would only be about 70 terabytes or you know, three or four nodes, depending on your node sizing. So that means you can store this kind of very detailed, very granular information for a long period of time and then perform analytics and querying on top of that. So who's using Apache Metron? Um, one of the organizations that's been very public about their, their Metron use is obviously Telstra. Um, they went basically from um, zero to eight months later, having a fully deployed running in production, having customers running on the platform. So they're a um, cybersecurity managed service provider. And they built two brand new security operation centers to host their new managed service. And the, the, their offerings are entirely powered by Apache Metron. Um, they spoke last year at our Data Work Summit out in Sydney. And the two quotes I really liked from them were one, um, you need to let the data and the statistics do the work and let the machine take over. It's no longer about having static rules necessarily that your analysts understand, but it's about having profiles and deviations from those profiles and the alerting based on that. The other one was about moving from a deterministic approach to a probabilistic approach. And back last year when they were talking, they, had, well, they were dealing with about 13 billion events per month and that was growing at about 30% every month. Other organizations using Metron, Capital One. Um, if you Google Capital One, Metron, and Purple Rain, um, you will see quite a few news articles about their Metron platform. This, as you can see, was taken from back when it was called Hadoop Summit, um, back in 2016, when they were sort of um, still relatively early in their journey. Um, and back then, they were dealing with about a billion events every day. And that was just for their corporate internal network, not counting the workloads from their external network. We also have um, QSight IT, um, recently acquired by KPN. They had a great talk yesterday. If you weren't able to catch it, I thoroughly recommend that uh, look out for the slide share and look out for the YouTube link. Um, 
a few interesting things from their journey. They, they talked about the fact they really were able to move from a, a static and rule-based security model through to a true risk-based security model. Um, they also had um, uh, the ability to innovate with this platform that you know, previous platforms in no way, shape, or form gave them. So the ability to add things like whitelisting and to modify parsing because this is an open platform. Um, and finally, they were able to move away from a siloed architecture to a full multi-tenant platform. Again, they're a managed cybersecurity services provider. So if you're getting into Metron, and many of you uh, um, were put your hands up when you said you were already kind of testing it in labs and things like that, one of the things you'll need to be thinking about is how you size this for your production deployment. I'd like to give you a few kind of considerations and things to think about. So the first one is events per second. Now, obviously, this is a big data platform. Many of the traditional platforms in this space actually license by EPS counts. So if you go over your EPS count, it just dumps data on the floor. Not terribly useful from a regulatory p perspective. We use Metron in, in uh, oh sorry, we use EPS counts in Metron really to define what we think is a, a respectable sizing criteria for the platform in order to handle this as a kind of real-time stream. So other things that you need to think about are the retention times for the different zones, and I'll talk about a little bit about those as we go through. How many enrichments are you going to enrich the data against? Let's say you've got web proxy logs or AD logs, authentication logs of some system. Um, maybe you're going to apply GOIP enrichment to them. Maybe you're going to apply um, uh, a CMDB to them, so you've got an asset registry and things like that to enrich that data. That would be two enrichments. Every enrichment you add obviously grows the, uh, the data ever so slightly. And if you're doing this fully streaming, fully real time, obviously it soon builds up. Um, node sizing. This also comes into the, the, the different zones, but you need to consider whether you're going to have you know, SSD-based nodes, so that really comes into the I.O. consideration. Generally, if you're at the hot layer, the indexing layer, that's going to be SSD-based. The cold layer, that's going to be large disks, rotational storage. The warm layer, something in between. The final point, Metron very, very handily deals with PCAP, and we've got an upcoming uh, feature that allows you to do some quite cool things with PCAP within Metron. Um, obviously, PCAP is quite large. If you're going to be storing PCAP for any long, any sensible period of time, uh, you really want to uh, uh, to think about that. Now, the nice thing with this is you don't need to go and go. Right, well, you know, I need to keep two years of data, so I'll go and build my two years worth of cluster immediately. That would be crazy. Although I would love you to do that and and come and work with us at HortonWorks if you are. But more sensibly, you're going to start this thing in uh, you know, various phases. So initially, you start off with a, a fast index layer and a warm layer. Typically, that fast index layer, whether it's solar or elastic search, around about three months of data. The warm layer, you're only three months in, so that will also be about three months of data. As you step through, one year in, you, know, you grow your uh, warm layer out to the full 12 months, but really, the hot layer only needs to probably stick at about three months. You're indexing into both of these layers. So the hot layer is really there for initial investigations. The warm layer is there for the, the deeper analysis. As you go past that initial kind of 12 months, then you'll start to use, uh, start to bring on a cold layer. Now, this is just HDFS storage tiering. So here you've got maybe nodes with 12 2 terabyte disks or something like that. The cold layer, maybe 12 or 24, 4 or 8 terabyte disks. Um, in the world of HDP um, 3 onwards, um, you'll be able to use things like erasure coding, and that will give you the ability to cut down uh, the replication from 3x that HDFS requires at the moment to 1.5x, so greater retention, uh, fewer nodes. So you know, beyond the 24 months, all you really need to do is carry on growing that cold layer. Um, so what does the ecosystem look like for Apache Metron? Well, 
thankfully it's looking quite healthy. Um, some of you may have seen that uh, PSSC Labs and uh, Cybersecurity Malaysia made a bit of a noise um, a little bit earlier on this year when PSSC Labs basically have a certified Metron appliance, if you like. Um, and Cybersecurity Malaysia um, are their sort of first flagship customer. Um, there's also some interesting things happening with um, visualization as well. So I was hoping to do this through live demo. Sadly, the uh, event Wi-Fi was a little bit uh, spurious. So instead, I'll just give you a quick um, video demo on this. So this is uh, a demo put together um, by our, our friends at Zoom Data. This is operating directly against Apache Metron. Um, and you can see here all of the exciting things that you'd expect to see on a, on a dashboard. I'm going to skip a little bit through this because uh, it's probably a little bit longer than we have time for. But uh, I start to uh, trigger something happening in the background. And you'll start to see some, some things changing in the graphs. Um, we have uh, terrible things happening at uh, banana.dp.ua. Um, this is uh, a simulated botnet attack in this particular uh, occurrence. And the, uh, the bubble charts and the heat maps will continue to, to change as more data floods in and the attack gets more vociferous. Um, so the other thing that, we've, uh, that they've worked on us to, to build out is uh, a dashboard against that same authentication data that I flashed up a little bit earlier and that Simon was talking about in his previous session. So for those of you that, uh, that remember Simon's session, um, there is a user, user 66, that is, turns out that was the, uh, the user that was on the red team that was actually doing the, uh, or attempting to break into the systems. And uh, you know, this dashboard is just built up to, again, bubble maps and various ring diagrams to show you things like um, login or log out events or authentication events and things like that. And you can see any of these things, if you hover over them, that would click then into a filter and you'd be able to drill into that further. What we're also looking to add is the ability to you know, select a subset of information via this visualization and then pass that level of filtering down through to the alerts UI so you can drill into the individual alerts through that UI as well. So you can see here, user 66 is uh, right at the top of the chart in terms of, uh, uh, in terms of alerts. We've also got a lot of attempts from anonymous login users. I don't rec recommend you have a lot of anonymous users within your environments. So I'll skip through this because there's one that I really want to show, which is this one. So this user authentication data um, is incredibly valuable. And once you've got a sort of relationship-based visualization built on top of that, even more so. So you can see the, the vision here. We've got, you know, you look like uh, flower petals or something similar, where you've got the black dots are users, the blue dots are systems, and you can see, you know, most, most of those systems are departmental style systems that people are having access to and working on. And, you know, those groups look relatively sane and relatively normal. Um, there is, however, let's see if we can uh, skip this along a little bit. There is, however, uh, there are a couple of anomalies. So first of all, we've got you know a little group of users all the way down here, not really connected to anything else, minding their own business, doing their own thing. Got a set of users that are sort of doing their own thing. There's a few users that are connected to the wider ecosystem. We've also got, um, you can see there's a, a, a TGT server here. So that's a Kerberos ticket server. So it would make sense that users would kind of very infrequently connect to it, and then once they've got a valid ticket, they would go off and probably not touch it again until that uh, that needs refreshing. But indeed, our uh, so there's the Kerberos ticket server. But the the most noticeable thing really is our good old friend user 66 here, um, who's attempting to connect to many 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 systems, and 
it's just one of those things that the patterns really kind of stand out in this kind of visualization. So let's see if we can switch back to this. So who else is using Apache Metron? What are they doing with it? Well, we did a project um, engagement last year with a large um, US automotive manufacturer. And they wanted to do some interesting, exciting things with PCAP coming in from their um, self-driving car platform. And very sort of early on in the OpenSock project, there was um, some benchmarking done where a number of fairly high power Cisco UCS servers were used. You know, the, the history of the Apache Metron project is it came from the OpenSOC project, which was a co-development between Hortonworks and Cisco. And at the end of that, uh, that OpenSOC project, there was some work done to benchmark it. And if you search 1.2 million events per second OpenSOC on Google, very quickly you'll find the, the sort of the slide share and the supporting tweets and posts and blogs about that sort of experience. So that was quite some time ago now. Um, fast forward, and that was on some fairly, fairly expensive, fairly high powered hardware. Fast forward to last year, um, we were running on eight very aged um, HP DL servers, several generations old, that really um, should have probably been thrown out. Um, we know they were old because we actually blew RAID controllers on them while we were doing it. We still managed 1.1 million events per second streaming PCAP through it, a number we were very, very happy with on uh, badly configured and very aged hardware. Um, some another project uh, we were working on last year, uh, late last year, was with a uh, major US telco. Um, they were having issues with their traditional scene platform. Um, their issues were you know, the obvious ones, retention, um, performance. They actually spun up two environments. One, you know, scaled down environment based on their existing seam, same hardware, all that sort of stuff. Similar environment, similar hardware using um, Apache Metron. They ran, ingested all the same data, ran the same tests. Um, Metron performed 29 to 30 times faster. So they got their results returned in, um, I think it was two seconds. Their SIEM platform took nearly a minute to return the results. Interestingly, their SIEM platform actually returned 373 results that they were searching for. Metron returned 398. So the SIEM platform actually dropped data even in this particular um, scenario. Um, We've also got um, a number of defense ministries across the world also using Apache Metron. Um, some of them still in quite the early stages, some of them very, very advanced. And large government agencies generally. You know, Cybersecurity Malaysia is one that I can talk about, which is public, but there are a number of smart cities projects, government-wide cybersecurity initiatives that are also either using Metron today or looking very, very hard and very close to using it. So what I'd like to just sort of um, come towards is really this all, uh, you know, you're using a lot of animals in the zoo. It's a relatively complex sort of project, a relatively complex deployment. How can we make this a little bit simpler, a little bit more easy to consume? So this is something that I built for a customer last year. This is a project that's actually now fully rolled out. And this is just to give you an idea of what that kind of phase deployment style journey might look like. So it starts off really with just deploying some, uh, wrong button, some HDF and some HDP. Um, once you've done that, get some data, start streaming that in, parse the data, and maybe get some AD information as well. Once you've got that, you can then enrich the data. Maybe also do some GOIP enrichment, 
then finally index that stuff out to you know solar or elastic search whichever is your preferred platform and then build some simple visualizations against it next step after that well start looking at some of the alert triage rules start looking at uh, things like getting additional data sources in there. Maybe you start off with just some, some DNS and some web proxy data, but then start adding um, things like NetFlow. Maybe you actually think, well, we, not just NetFlow, we can maybe get some, some snort data or row data or, um, or even PCAP data. And then on from that, you can start to do some really interesting, exciting things. So things like adding uh, Zeppelin dashboards as runbooks for your cybersecurity team. One of the th nice things, nice evolutions of this story we've seen is runbooks in, in security operations centers really used to be documents or PDFs or web pages that were written by senior analysts to describe if you see this set of conditions, then perform these set of actions which is all very well and good, but that all that ends up is usually those things go out of date very quickly. Also, you've got people then swiveling between different environments to read the runbook, execute the tasks on different systems. The idea with the Zeppelin dashboards replacing those runbooks is they become interactive runbooks. So you can have runbooks created by your senior analysts that then can be executed by you know, putting in an event, a meta event, a series of events, a timeline into the Zeppelin dashboard, just having the junior SOC analyst then execute the dashboard and they then have the, the completed runbook results that they can then submit as the, the actions for that. You've also got some interesting things you can do with things like automated response. Um, we actually have a customer that uses Metron with um, a virtual desktop infrastructure. And when they have a high severity, high certainty that one of their virtual desktop environments has been compromised, they just go off and rebuild it. It gets automatically rebuilt through orchestration that kicks off in the background from those events. Now, there are also some additional threat triage pieces in that that says, you know, if it's a manager of this level or above, maybe don't rebuild his laptop or his, his virtual desktop instance immediately, maybe give him a notification or his secretary a notification. Um, so that is all I really had. Um, hopefully I've given you a little bit of a flavor as to you know, what people are doing with Apache Metron. But my favorite part of all of this is, does anybody have any questions? Oh, come on, someone must have questions. Masoyan, go for it. So, so the question is, how do you set this up? Um, and as with, as with all, good, all good questions, the answer is it depends. Um, if you just want something to play with, um, then we actually have a single node AMI. And if you're interested in that, let me know. Um, I can give you the details for that. Um, that just spins up a single node instance. There are a few things I would recommend. Give it, um, give it provisioned IOPS disk because it's fairly IO hungry and it's a single instance anyway. So you'll need to give it a fairly beefy single instance. That really is just for if you're looking to do some testing, fiddling, kicking the tires, and generally just poke at things. Um, if you're going to do something sort of more serious, I'd recommend about 12 nodes. That gives you a chance to really kick the tires in something sensible. It allows you to give things like Storm and Kafka and NiFi and Spark and all these things enough separation so you can get some serious work done. You can scale it down to something smaller. Um, but typically, that's where I recommend people start if they're looking to do something serious. Um, as to whether to install it on um, a, you know, a brand new environment or um, on your existing data lake, again, the answer is it depends. Many organizations have um, existing 
regulatory compliance or internal security considerations that say the data that we're pulling in for the cybersecurity platform is so critical, we, we just can't afford to have it on the same environment that other users have access to. Even with role-based asset control, tag-based asset control, all these other things, we're just not going to do it. In that case, you go separate. Other organizations have a different view of things, and they say, well, you know, we can partition this in a way that our regulators or our auditors or our security team are happy with, and we can just run it as an application on our data lake. Um, the only thing I would add to that is Apache Metron is a very fast-moving project. Um, there are new releases of Apache Metron, new feature-bearing releases about every quarter, so about every three months. And what that means is you have to think about what's the life cycle of your existing data lake environment that probably has many different third-party tools and technologies and platforms all kind of hooked into it. Well, if that's the case, are they going to be able to, to deal with that sort of um, regular upgrade process? Or would it make sense from an operational perspective to keep those things separate? Those are kind of some of the considerations, I would think. But both options are completely viable. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, no. So, so the question was, what are the different methods you can use to detect a breach? Um, so the answer to most of the questions about the analytics behind Metron is Profiler. Um, um, there are a number of things you can do. And if, I, if you remember the, the Metron sort of diagram, side-to-side -side diagram you saw towards the beginning of the session, um, one of the things it showed was model as a service. And you can run machine learning models, and model as a service within Metron takes care of how many of those models do I need to spin up, how to deal with the throughput, how do I deal with the life cycle of those models, and all that sort of thing. But machine learning has a cost, not just in terms of expensive GPUs, potentially, if you're using deep learning and TensorFlow and all that sort of thing, but it has a cost in terms of time. And the thing that you need to remember about this versus many other cybersecurity solutions is this is a full real-time streaming application. So that's why we have the thing called the profiler. And the profiler is able to use these statistics or generate statistical sketches of the data as it flows through. So um, an example would be something called uh, degree of host. So is something you know, primarily, um, primarily a server, primarily a client, or a something middleware? So is it primarily upload, primarily download, or a bit of both? You can generate a statistical data sketch around that. And if that profile changes drastically, that would suggest something odd has happened to that system. So if you've got that data, that's an indicator. Then maybe on top of that, you look at user access. Um, you know, Maybe you've got users randomly logging into that, uh, and that's all fine. But maybe they're mostly logging in between 8 and 6. If you've got a user that logs in sort of outside of that time and soon after that event, the degree of host changes, maybe they're uploading data, maybe they're downloading data from a server that's not usually doing that. So all of these things kind of build together into a more consistent profile of what's happening across the systems. Another example I like to use is passwords. Um, static rule-based systems will usually say, if you get your password wrong more than X number of times, then we'll you know, lock your account or tell your manager or slap your wrist. Um, so all that happens is people that are attacking kind of skate under that number. They, you know, if the limit is six, they'll try five times, and then they'll wait. They'll work out what the, the duration for that time to expire is. And then they'll try another five times. And eventually, across your entire user base, they will get in somehow. So, But what Metron does is... Um, it uses these data sketches, and it looks at the statistics of what people are doing. And it generates these statistics against each and every entity on the system, so each and every user. 
So I usually get my password right first or second time. Uh, one, of my, one of my colleagues regularly gets his password right on the sixth or seventh time. Now, a static rule of you know, five would regularly get his machine locked, and I would be fine all the time. But if his account is compromised, and a script then regularly gets on every time, first time, a static rule-based system wouldn't catch that. A profiler-based system would catch that, because it would be more than so many standard deviations from his typical login pattern. You can also generate these profiles across and profile people across their peer groups. Um, people in, in a sales role, for example, will have very different um, login profiles and access profiles to those that are in more of a technical system administrator role and that sort of thing. Sysadmins regularly log into a number of machines. Salespeople, if they can find their laptop, it, they're having a good day. So, you know, you can, you can create these profiles across geographies, across anything that you've enriched. Um, so hopefully that sort of gives you a, an answer to the question. Yeah, question at the back. Yeah, so GDPR. Um, this is based on all of the same components and technologies that you know and love. It's based on, you know, it supports Ranger for uh, role-based and asset-based and tag-based asset control. It supports um, Atlas for governance and that side of things. Um, hopefully, those of you in the keynote saw some of the demos this morning of some of the exciting stuff coming down the line. That will all work seamlessly with what I've been talking about today. So all of those kind of same considerations apply. One of the things about GDPR is also about detecting, or once you've detected breaches, making that notification. One of the things that we're trying to get to is let's get to the position where the number of times that you actually have to notify anybody is significantly reduced. So you find the attempts to attack before they actually get through. All right. The door is open and people are starting to uh, to shuffle out, but I think we've got time for one more. Go for it. Yeah. Great question. So the question was, how do honeypots factor into um, the Metron situation? So there is actually um, a Canadian company using Apache Metron today with a set of honeypot devices. Um, and they're gathering a whole set of, uh, of intelligence and information around that. Um, so for us, really, that the honeypots are just one more data source that you can plumb through into this. But yeah, nice question. All right, if there are no more, doesn't look like it. All right, well, thank you very much. For those of you that were lured here by free stickers, please approach the bench. Thank you.